Good morning. Welcome, everybody. We have a special honor today of having with us, in addition to Master First Amendment expert Jeff Portnoy, former University of Toledo Law School professor and raconteur Ben Davis, and former Northern Illinois and South Texas Dean and Professor Jim Alfini. We have a truly amazing and diverse cast of characters for this one. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom, your insights, and most of all in these times, your sense of humor. Okay, putting the humor just to the side for a second. Rule of law. What are the things happening right now that are the farthest off the rails and most bother you or give you anxiety? about our rule of law. Anyone want to take first shot? I'll let our distinguished guests go first. People have listened to me for the last two months. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that hasn't been mentioned too much, Chuck, um, is the, the way the Trump administration is conducting sort of a guerrilla warfare um, uh, within the machinery of the federal government, particularly administrative agencies, uh, dismantling regulations that have been in place for decades, um, dismissing staff, um, not enforcing certain laws. Um, and uh, maybe the tip of that iceberg right now is the Postmaster General, um, who's gone out and done things like decommissioned sorting machines in many key uh, states. Um, why is he doing that? Well, it doesn't take too much of a, uh, an imagination to understand that uh, he's setting, um, uh, setting us up for electoral election challenges that uh, are gonna favor the president. So I, 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 it's, it's a harder thing to put your finger on, but it's sort of this disrespect for the, the, the governmental agencies that have been in place that are doing their job uh, and now aren't doing their job. Yeah. That's For political purposes. And we now have three federal court decisions basically telling Trump and DeJoy, stop that stuff. Mm -hmm. Put it back the way it was. Ben? Uh, um, I, I would go along with that uh, in one, one way, which is uh, I was really quite disturbed that the uh, essentially political appointee who is head of the DNI now, a guy named uh, Ratscape, I think it is, um, just, you know, declassified stuff that the Senate Intelligence Committee has said had no credibility with regards to a, basically a smear on, uh, I think, on, of course, on Biden or something like that. Um, in other words, you got this Russian disinformation that's been discredited by the a bipartisan Senate uh, committee that in turn then gets declassified in that selective declassification game, uh, which uh, when you got that happening out of the intelligence community, uh, the people below it, I believe, tend to complain internally, but they're not the kind that necessarily will actually go out as much uh, extensively as they might. They might have the retired people who do it. Uh, so that bothers me. The other thing is uh, there's an arbitrator who just decided a case at the University of Akron, which is here in Ohio, where the university wants to uh, essentially lay off about a hundred faculty. And so the faculty union uh, filed a grievance and there was an arbitration that happened. And under the union contract, um, basically the power to do that for that university came from uh, if there were catastrophic circumstances such as force majeure. And he concludes that yes, this is the COVID and all that is a catastrophic circumstance. And so the process can go forward. So he went forward for the administration of that university. And what bothered me about that was just that, you know, the kind of inept uh, manner in which our government has addressed COVID, then in the context of this 
layoff structure uh, is basically allowing this particular administration to say, oh, well, we can lay off people using COVID uh, because it's so catastrophic. It's, it's so catastrophic because of the inept way we've been dealing with it for six months as a country. You know, it just seemed to me a very bizarre way to end, uh, to, to, to see force majeure, first of all, and secondly, uh, to then f allow it to be an excuse to lay off 100 people. It just seemed, uh, it, you, you know, it's like a lose-lose a, a game. You have an inept response, and then you have, we can use this to lay off people. It just doesn't seem right. Well, to me, what's left of the rule of law, which is supposed to be shared between the three branches of government, is part of a single branch, and that's the judiciary. Uh, if it wasn't for the federal district courts and sometimes the circuit courts and even occasionally the Supreme Court and some Democratic attorney generals, there'd be no rule of law because both the Senate and the executive branch have no interest in the rule of law. And so we have lost two of the three prongs, at least during the last and present present administration. So I'm heartened. I mean, you can argue that there's too many Federalist Society judges and uh, things like that. You can argue about the politicization of the Supreme Court. But when you look at what's happening around them in the Justice Department, uh, in the executive branch, in the administrative agencies, we are fortunate to still have uh, an independent judiciary. And as long as we do, there's some hope. So let me ask you folks a question. <laughs> Taking Ben's point about the use of COVID as an emergency situation to justify departing from all kinds of legal precedents and authorities. We now have a president who said, his idea is throw out the votes, don't count the ballots. I'm going to get the state legislat legislatures to exercise their power over the electoral votes for the electoral college. And if there's a problem, I'm going to get the Supreme Court. This is going to wind up in the Supreme Court. That's my avenue. That's my method. And if people ask, so why does he need that sixth vote? Maybe one of the reasons is Trump has already come out against Chief Justice Roberts for decisions in the LGBTQ case and other cases. He knows he can't count on him for unfettered corruption. Maybe with that sixth vote, instead of a 4-4 tie with Roberts with the other three, he's got his certain majority. Well, you know, other than the hypocrisy, I, I really don't have much sympathy for the left on this particular issue. I mean, they should have thought about it four years ago when they allowed Trump to get elected by not going to the polls, et cetera. And they should have been more concentrated on state legislatures 10 years ago. I mean, they have refocused on that. I, I am not one of these people who's crying wolf about the Senate's attempt and the president's attempt to get Barrett appointed. You know, look, you want to put a litmus test on judges, I think that's wrong. He has the right to nominate. They have the right to confirm. Yes, there's tremendous hypocrisy based upon what happened with Garland. But you know what? That's the state of American politics, Chuck. So, you know, whether it's a sixth vote, I still am not willing to say that the justices on the Supreme Court are motivated by politics. I really am. I I'm not. I mean, I think I disagree with certainly the four conservatives on almost every one of their judicial interpretations, but that's the way it goes. I mean, you know, during Earl Warren's days, this was reversed. So uh, I'm one that is, uh, I think there's a lot of crying wolf going on, on this particular issue. Not about throwing out ballots, by the way. I think what's going on there is outrageous. But I'm talking about getting the sixth vote on the court and how it might, quote, politically affect the outcome of the election. 
So, you know, uh, I, no, go, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say that, uh, so I volunteered with a group, uh, Reverend Barber's uh, Poor People's Campaign, and uh, we're actually going to have a demonstration on Monday, uh, which is a car caravan to go around Senator Portman's um, local office here in Toledo and Cincinnati and other places too. But one of the things that I liked about what they were saying is that, you know, stimulus has been held up for a long time, okay? And then all of a sudden we're moving earth and sky to get this confirmation of this judge. And that instead of focusing on the con you know, confirmation of the judge, let's focus on getting stimulus to ordinary people and getting that deal done. And I like that argument about all this. Obviously, it's not, you know, yeah, they have the power to do what they do. I agree with Jeff with all that, the nomination, the advice and consent. But can we get a few priorities straight here in regards to, like, there are people who are really, really suffering right now. There's uh, food banks here in Ohio are clamoring for help with regards to uh, people. There's the whole evictions issue for people, even though they may be, delayed uh, till January, they're gonna have these balloon payments on rent. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there's like a so, whole series of issues that uh, a stimulus package can help uh, that's actually gonna go into people's pockets. People need it badly. Um, I'm doing okay myself, but you know, that's the news that I'm getting as I've been involved with this campaign. So that's the strategy that I think as opposed to this, let's pack the court stuff or or what was the other things that they've been talking about? Let's have an 18 year term for the justices. I think that that's this, uh, you know, again, going along with Jeff, it's just poppycock really, but that to focus the energy on the stimulus package before anything else gets done, I thought was very smart. That's what we're gonna try to do on Monday. We'll see what happens. Jim? Well, you know, I, I'd agree with Ben uh, up to a point. Um, I, I think Jeff is absolutely right. I mean, you can go back to Jacksonian democracy and to the to the victor belongs the spoils. And so the winner, of the, if, if you can put a president in the White House and put the same party uh, as a majority of the Senate, uh, then this is what you would expect. Sure, there's gonna be a lot of hypocrisy, but it's political. The process is political. Um, it's part of our democratic infrastructure, if you will. I think one of the things, though, we could look to, and some of the candidates have talked about this on and off, uh, is democracy reform. Um, there are some things about our infrastructure that probably should be changed. A good example is the Electoral College. Um, it comes up, I mean, twice in the two decades of the 21st century, we had a, a president take office when the uh, when his opponent his or her opponent um, uh, had the popular vote, um, so the electoral college has trumped the see um, that's a bad pun uh, has trumped the the um, uh, popular vote twice. Um, it's it's a vestige of colonial well it's a vestige really of of um, the. Uh, well, actually, even, even James Madison, who's the darling of the Federalist Society, was in favor of, of popular, a popularly elected president. It was quite a debate. Um, I think they, they took it out of the hands of the states uh, when, they, when they created the Electoral College. So it was sort of a compromise. But why do we need that? Uh, I was teaching a constitutional law class um, about 10 years ago, no, about 20 years ago. I'm old, um, at Northern Illinois, and we had a debate following the Bush-Gore election uh, over why do we need an electoral college? And um, there was a student from Montana and a student from North Dakota in the class, and I hate to say it, but they sort of won over the class uh, with the argument that um, if, if we get rid of the electoral colleges, nobody will come to North Dakota or Montana. They'll, they'll campaign in the big cities, we'll all be forgotten. You know, um, we, they'll, they'll go for the, the, the vote if it's a popular uh, vote. So at any rate, I think we, we, need to, we need to bring back some more discussion 
over democracy reform, if you will. It, we don't have a perfect system. No. Well, I mean, why does each state have two senators based yeah. upon population? I mean, we're talking about systemic change that is very unlikely, James, as you know, but makes democratic sense. I mean, New York and California have the same number of senators as Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, what sense does that make? So I think it goes hand in hand with your comments about the Electoral College. I'm trying to remember how many states have already voted to do away. Is it like 18 already? I mean, there is a number. There are a number of states which have already voted for a constitutional amendment. Yeah, mm. I think that's right. Um, you know, there's some other, that's a good, another good thing to talk about. There's some other, the Equal Rights Amendment is still arguably out there. Needs one state. One state away. It's time barred, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's there's some unfinished business. This, this is, the American democracy is still an experiment. There's yep. some unfinished business there that needs to be taken care of. Uh, this is probably not the right time to talk about it because we've got the election looming and stuff and, you know, people aren't going to turn their attention to constitutional amendments and things like that. But let's not miss the forest for the trees. Right, right. Well, you know, we say that uh, for the Federalists, Madison's their darling, right? Well, I actually happen to be a kind of Madisonian in the sense that I really like the idea of the double security of the rights of the people with our separation of powers and federalism and all the competitions between everybody that would protect us because imagine if we had one leader with all that power as opposed to our governors and all the rest and uh so you know i just look at kind of how the system works and see where am i being protected where are my rights is where, where is the double security working for me as, as an ordinary american in terms of this battle between these competing groups I think that the executives, the governors have done a number of good jobs with regards to, uh, to, to, to blocking some of the more inane things that have been done. Um, I know it works both ways. I understand that. Uh, the governors were on the uh, Affordable Care Act trying to get rid of it after November 10th. But you know, it, at least it's not just a central government with just a, you know, a, the Congress, an executive president and a judiciary that goes all the way down. I mean, maybe I'm just kind of old school on that, but I, I like to watch the battle because it, power is diffused somewhat, at least. Well, maybe. you know, what, what I think is going to happen, going back to Chuck's question about a six-vote court, I think it's pretty clear, talking about James, about where people are going to want to live. As this Supreme Court is going to strike down federal regulations and federal laws on everything from abortion to you name it, uh, gay rights, whatever, it's, they're going to throw it back to the states. And you talk about deciding where to live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, we're lucky to live in Hawaii. I, I think about it every day for, for the last four years, even more than ever because I really don't care what the federal government does because our state, when it's allowed, does so much more than the federal government does. So, you know, in five years, if you're a liberal, you won't be living in North Dakota. You, you'll be moving, even though you don't wanna live in a state like California for other yeah. <laughs> reasons and vice versa. I think that's gonna be the outcome of a six vote majority on the Supreme Court, maybe even starting on November 10th with healthcare. Yeah. And there's yeah. a related factor, Jeff, which I'll ask you folks about. That majority has also very consistently, strongly supported presidential control over executive agencies and the heads of those agencies. So whenever they exercise any independence, even if Congress established them with a four cause requirement, for termination, that's been overrun. So the yeah. presidential control over those agencies, that's our environment, that's our education, that's our health and human services, that's immigration, that's exactly the things you folks were talking about. Is that coming? Well, here's the thing that maybe gives me a little optimism on that, which is the 
at least the Supreme Court's deference to some extent with regards to the executive branch's statements of what should happen has been eroding also, I think, over the last 20 years. I think a good part of it is because they found themselves to have been hoodwinked by, uh, uh, not necessarily by the lawyers involved, the lawyers were hoodwinked, and then they find out afterward that in fact there were shenanigans going on in the background. That happened with torture and all that. I just was involved with the case uh, on, believe it or not, international arbitration, so it's not really everybody's stuff, but there was a presentation made by the Solicitor General as to sort of what the law should be in this space. And it was Justice Thomas who wrote the 9-0 that was against my position, yay! But uh, Justice Thomas in that really hesitated to give any weight or decide what weight should be given to what was said by the executive branch, which I thought was a kind of interesting moment where, you know, we're not gonna go there sort of thing, which I thought was an interesting statement of let's, you know, a little hesitancy or skepticism towards the, the information coming from the federal government. Then of course you had the issue with the census and the, 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 the ad hoc uh, post hoc reasoning for trying to have the uh, immigration status on there. And they said, you know, was it this Administrative Procedures Acts were not respected with, you know, or something like that. I mean, those are those kind of little hooks in the road, so to speak, that uh, that the courts do that uh, are important, you know. Here, here's the interesting thing for guys that are our age, James. <laughs> <laughs> Soon to be. <laughs> Turn the whole state's rights argument of 40 and 50 years ago on its head. Absolutely. You know? I mean, 40 or 50 years ago, the liberals were screaming about the federal government taking over all of these things, the segregation and you know, public accommodations, you name it. Yep. Now, in the next few years, it's gonna be the opposite. They're gonna be screaming, the state of California should decide vehicle admissions for the state yeah. of California. So it's it's just really ironic how things go over decades. Yeah. 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 And uh, so can, can I can I um, turn back to the rule of law question at the beginning, but please. take a, a slightly different tack on that? Please. Um, the one of my friends said to me the other day, knowing that I sit in the House of Delegates of the American Bar Association. Why aren't you guys speaking out about what Trump is doing to the rule of law here? Um, you know, why isn't the ABA speaking out loudly? And, you know, so I mumbled something, well, it's a membership organization. There are a lot of people that support Trump. They're going to lose members if they take sides, that kind of thing. But um, our good friend Ben Davis here um, has submitted a letter to the Association of American Law Schools and Law School Deans, um, basically denouncing this administration's, um, the eroding of the rule of law during this administration. And Ben, I, th I think there's 16 different areas that you mentioned in that letter. Um, and so I, I suspect that there'll be more movement along these lines of groups like law professors, um, doctors, who knows who, who uh, speaking out uh, during this campaign season. What do you think, Ben? Well, I, I do know that there's one going on with con law professors too. You know, that only by people who teach substantially in con law, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> designed only by them. It, my, that's an inside yeah. joke, inside that's joke. That's an inside joke. <laughs> con law is like at the top of the hierarchy of law, law professorships. Another one uh, that I saw is interesting is four international law professors have sued the Trump administration with regards to the sanctions on the International Chamber of uh, the, the International Criminal Court people coming because uh, they do have been working with the International Criminal Court for a long time and, and it has an effect on what they do and all that. And that's just been filed, I think, in, in New York as a, a case that this is a uh, uh, I, I haven't read the case, but it, I just got it today, actually. So that's another example of sort of- Well, uh, unfortunately, if I remember correctly, the United States is not a signatory to the Rome Convention, 
which created right. the International right. Criminal Court. No, no. Uh, they, we are, they, there's Trump's out, you know, right there. Right. You guys but, but are just I, dealing, in, you're dealing in fake news. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fake news. I mean, right. you know, look, guys, the bottom line is nobody listens to the ABA anymore. Not the 40 percent that are going to vote for Trump, even if he does shoot somebody on Park <laughs> Avenue. How many judicial appointees, nominees, has the ABA come out against? And it's meant zero as being unqualified. I mean, let's just face it. I mean, I always love these dialogues because we talk to the same people that believe. <laughs> like we, <laughs> But there's 40 percent of the people that are not listening or agreeing with a single thing we're talking about today. There's 50% of the people who agree with 90% of what we're saying. Maybe there's five to 10% that can be moved a little bit one way or the other. That's the sad thing about what's going on in the country. How many former Justice Department US attorneys, was it 2000, have written yeah. a letter? Yeah. Who cares? I mean, right. you know, I'm, just, I'm not being cynical. I'm just trying to be realistic of where no. we are as a country, how Trump has so poisoned and, and the internet has so poisoned 40% of the country into believing that there's child molestation going on in a pizza restaurant in Washington, DC. Yeah, well, um, I, I was talking the other day when they were cutting down, a, the city was cutting down a tree outside with the, with the guy who was working on that crew. And, you know, he was saying that he's, basically Trump because he thinks that he'll bring back the economy, okay? That's his, really the thing. And when you're desperate, and I remember back in 2016, some of these folks in small towns in Pennsylvania and all that, that's what their thing was, is that he's a businessman, and so he'll bring back the economy. That's what they're, that's what they're hard. But one of the things interesting about this guy was that he said that George Floyd thing, this is a white guy, okay? Older white guy. He was like, that George Floyd thing, that was wrong. That was really wrong, you know? I mean, he said that was just really awful. And uh, so, I mean, I think that's the bet people are making is that they think that he'll bring back the economy. And that's, I mean, not as, uh, I mean, there are you know, the wild proud boys and all that type. But I bet you a lot of folks, that's what's going on. And now we know that he turns out to the tax stuff is pretty devastating. I thought for me is the I mean not that anybody cares, but the guy's like a you know he really is a bullshitter in chief. Sorry, I don't know if I could say that on this, but I mean yeah. he's a bullshitter. In fact, I got myself a T-shirt made that just came before here. I didn't want to put it on with COVID, but it says "Tired of the bullshitter in chief." I mean it's just you know yeah I I you know I. Let me take Jeff on for a moment. Jeff, I suspect you and I are of one mind on 99% of, of the issues that we could bring up. But the one thing I challenge you on is that it doesn't matter um, because the, the, he's got this base. His base is big, but it's not big enough to elect him. And that's why he's trying to screw around with the elections because he knows that he's probably gonna lose the vote. Um, I was listening to The View this morning, the television program. I got about 25% of what I know I learned from The View. Um, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg and somebody else were basically making Jeff's point. And um, uh, one of the other, God, what's her name? Anyway, Joy? Uh, Joy Bayar? Or... No, not Joy, Joy Bayar. Uh, the, the, the woman who used to be a prosecutor. At any rate, she basically, she pointed out that there's still a 14% undecided, undecided vote out there. I mean, 14%, that's a big number to influence. And we should do everything we can to try to get those undecideds in the right column. I, I don't, James, I, I agree with you completely. I don't think it's 14%, but it's certainly somewhere, you know, seven to 12. But, I, you know, I'm not an expert. It depends what poll you read. I don't disagree. I think it's, you know, God willing, Trump doesn't have a chance. I think we see that his numbers aren't going anywhere. He's gonna get 40, 42%. Yes, the electoral college is a, is a real issue as you pointed out, big time, big time. And I agree. I mean, the only thing that's gonna save this election in my view, the only thing is a massive Biden victory. 
Otherwise, we are not going to know the winner of this election until February or March. But you know, and I'm sure Ben knows, that both sides have hired an army of lawyers. Yeah. In fact, I, I volunteered to assist Biden, but the Republicans have an equal number, and they are going to challenge the results in every state in which there's a margin of error. And so when people say, oh, well, you know, uh, if Biden wins Florida, you know, where he's up by 1%, it's going to make, you know, uh, Bush versus Gore look like nursery school. So thank you. I, yes. I agree with you, James. We need all 14% because we need a six, we need a 55 plus percent popular vote victory and yeah. 300 plus electoral votes. And on that uh, note, I want to speak definitely. down the ticket too. Just remember down the ticket too. It's not just the yes, president, sir. all the way down the ticket especially the Senate. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time. We're out of time for today, but we've got momentum. We'll be back in two weeks. Hope you folks will join us. Eric, thanks for monitoring and running this. Enjoyed it, guys. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Excellent. A lot of fun.